I'm going to talk about four lessons from the cross today. I'll try not to be long, uh, but there are so many lessons that we could learn from the cross. And so I don't want you to get up and leave today and be like, there's only four lessons. No, there are so many lessons. We just don't have enough time. Okay, and so I am I'm excited to just kind of talk about a few of these. And it's interesting because whenever we think about the cross, I think that sometimes we think that somebody took Jesus and made him do something. And the interesting thing is that Jesus was never pushed. Jesus was never drugged. Jesus was never. Now, hear me now, like they're taking him to a cross, but. It was never outside of his will. And at the end, the reason for him getting to the cross, just look at your neighbor and do this for me. If you'll just preach the whole message for me in about five seconds, just look at your neighbor and say, it was for you. It was for you. The entire journey of Jesus's life, uh, and last week, uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, Lazarus leading up to Good Friday, and I left the service last week, and my wife goes, I'm pretty sure you preached an Easter message today. And then I was like, I did. Now what do I have for next week? <laughs> Four lessons from the cross. So um, we talked about the resurrection, and we talked just about how important those last three years of Jesus' life is uh, 89 chapters of the New Testament of the Gospels of the Gospels are given solely to the last three years. 29 of those chapters are dedicated to the last seven days of Jesus's life. The last seven days, the time we are celebrating currently right now, is very important for your Christian walk. And it, it the first thing I think about when I think about the cross, and we'll just call this lesson one, is love. I'm going to read some scriptures, and um, today you're going to get a few of them. So if you brought a pen and you want to write them down, meditate them, uh, meditate on them later, you can. But I'll just try to move quick just, just to help save time. So Hebrews 12, 2 says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before you. Do you know what the joy was? You're going to preach again. Are you ready to preach today? You didn't come to church on Easter Sunday and think that you were going to be the preacher. But you're going to be the preacher today. I need you to do me a favor. I need you to look at your neighbor. Not the, not the one you chose last time. The one you didn't choose the first time. Look at that neighbor and tell them you are the joy set before him. You are the joy set before him. Now, I don't know if you've ever uh, experienced um, love that required a little bit of sacrifice, but if you're married in this room, husbands, this is not when you look to the person sitting next to you, um, but you probably have had moments when you wanted to do something. Like, for instance, maybe you're like me and you like to fish and you wanted to go fishing, but you needed to do some husbandly duties. And you tried to negotiate your way out of the husbandly duties so that you could go fishing. Because Jesus sought out fishermen. And if Jesus sought out fishermen, then I should go represent Jesus by being a fisherman, right? And so I, w I would come up with all kinds of things. One time my dad was spanking me, and, and I looked at my dad right before he was going to spank me, and I said, Dad! Jesus isn't done with me yet. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good on my feet. I'm pretty good. I can think. And I, I have to think about Jesus' love was silent. And oftentimes, whenever we think about love, we bring it into our dimension. And so we think about Christ's love for us on the cross, and we think, man, what a sacrifice I have to sacrifice to. You know, I watched my own kids this week. If you're a guy, you're like, I, husbands, do this. Never, this is not an Easter message. Never say I'm babysitting my kids. Okay? You're not babysitting. You're a father. Okay? There we go. Okay, there you go. Moms, you can, you can applaud later. It's okay. All right, there you go. All right. I called one of my friends one time. He goes, I got I to gotta babysit my kids. <laughs> Are you babysitting someone else's kids or your own kids? Do you have the whole street at your house or... You know, and so I think sometimes we think we're experiencing sacrifice. We, we really try to reduce God's love oftentimes to our earthly understanding of love. 
The reason why I love Hebrews so much is he says, for the joy set before. Now, when I think about joy, I'm not talking about, like, happiness. Happiness is uh, superficial, you know? Like, I went to a Bucks game. I was happy. I went to a Bucks game with Dave Moreland, who has, like, seats on the 20th row. I was really happy, okay? I have been to, to venues. I've been to places, and I've been really happy. But I've also been frustrated in the parking lot when I didn't get the parking spot I wanted. Or I was walking to the stadium and it started raining. And so joy is, despite the circumstances, I'm still. Joyful, thank you. You did great on the first two times you preached. The third time, okay, we're going to, you get better. By the end of the message, you're going to be like, dude, I'm called to be a preacher, okay? So you're going to be good, all right? So the thing that I think about when I think about Jesus and I think the joy set before him, I read it like this. For the joy, for the Jeremiah set before him, Jesus endured the cross. For the joy of Juliana, he endured the cross. For the joy of Sarah, he endured the cross. For the joy of Martha, he endured the cross. For the joy of Pastor Jose, he endured the cross. For the joy of Ellie, he endured the cross. For the joy of Put your name in, he endured the cross. He went with you in his heart and on his mind. And I think when I'm thinking about the cross, and I, if you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ, I mean, you, next to just going to a movie, if you ever want to go to a movie that no one talks during, just turn that one on. No one will have their phone out. No one will be surfing Facebook. It's crickets. The first time I went to watch The Passion of the Christ in the movie theater, the movie ended and no one moved. And I thought to myself, it's because we all look like a train wreck because we've all been sitting here weeping. And it was just like this silence. And then we got up out of the theater and we walked out the door and no one talked. We got into the parking lot and friends separated and did not talk. Why? Because we were watching for the first time, what we could really not ever really understand by just reading something, this, this producer painted an accurate depiction of Jesus' love for us walking to the cross, and in the process, we were watching something that we had no earthly understanding of. So as a father or a mother, you may say something like this. You may say, well, I would lay my life down for my kids. And there's no doubt, I know some of you. You probably wouldn't lay your life down. You would just lay the other person down. And then you would, you know, be like Jesus. Of course you would raise him from the dead. I mean, we know that. That's like, it's like your biblical mandate. But I know, like, there is a, there's a mama's thing, you know? Like, don't mess with my kids. Don't try to harm my kids. There's a father's thing that wants to protect. And Jesus is about a gazillion times greater than that. And he has every one of us in mind during the process. Let's read another verse. 1 Corinthians 13, if you've ever been to a wedding, you would normally read the second half of this. But the reason why it's read so many times at weddings is because we're really trying to equip people who are getting married with what love is. And if you notice, he never says, love is butterflies. Love is holding hands, walking through the park at night. No. No. Paul's like, love is patient, love is kind, love endures. You're like, wait, where's the butterflies? And because what he's doing is he's trying to paint a picture with words of what the love of Jesus looks like in our life and how we can do it. I want to read the first three verses out of the ESV. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels... But have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but not love, I gain nothing. And what he's saying is you can do all the work she want to do. You can usher all you want to usher. You can love your spouse all you want to. You know, you can do works around the house. You can, but if you have love, if you don't have love, you have nothing. Like it's the love motivator in us 
that Christ wants to see released through us. And so let's go here. Here's another one. 1 John 4.10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. His love did something that will forever mark and change your life. For instance, how many of you in this room are sinless? Okay, let's, let's make it easier. How many of you are sinless in the last 72 hours? Now, let me just help you. If you drove 56 in a 55, you sinned. I'm just going to help you because the Bible says obey the laws of the land, and that's one of them. I broke it on the way to church, okay? It was early. There was no one out. We don't just need it one time. We need it all the time. And when he came to the cross, his love initiated something in our life that will forever mark us for the change. His love isn't temporary. His love isn't just like a monetary thing. Like, you know, we go, well, well I love God. He's like a lottery machine, and I, I give offerings, and he gives me back lots of money. No. Pick up your cross and follow me. He never promises us that his love won't cost you something, but his love brings things to you that nothing else. I don't know if you're in this place this morning and maybe you didn't grow up. Maybe you did because, you know, us church kids weren't great either. But maybe, maybe you really were like a really good heathen. Maybe you were on the street, on the corner, chasing your next high, trying to find that very thing that when you encountered Jesus, when the love of God entered into you, you forever were changed. And the thing you were chasing in the world to bring a fix to you, now he did in one encounter. And we are constantly going after this love of God. We're pursuing this love of God. Because what I find with sin is that people are constantly chasing something for the next great something. And the thing that's missing is the love of God. And when you experience the love of God and you know the love of God, then you understand this is what it is to be in right standing with God. And so we constantly are pursuing the love that he did when he uh, was on the cross. We'll read one more. John 3, 16, for, for God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life, that God sent his son to forever mark love for you and to change you. One of the four core values of this house, the fourth one, is marked by love. And whenever we were developing the core values, I wanted something that talked about being marked by his love because I believe that the transformation that took place in my life, in Jeremiah Crouch's life, was the one that I was marked there are some, we have, a, we have another one that's called found in his presence. And I believe we are found. Our true identity is released when we're in God's presence. But when you experience the love of God, you are forever changed. When you walk into a place and you feel hopeless and you feel, you feel desolate, you feel like you have nothing in you to give, and all of a sudden you experience the love of God, you then understand this is what I have been missing. In fact, let me just pause. Maybe you're in this place this morning. Maybe you had a relationship with Jesus, but you have walked away from him. I would challenge you today that there could have been emotions that came over. Don't just chalk up emotions for your tears. That is actually the love of God penetrating your soul, and he is reminding you of what he did. It's not just a picture of him on the cross. It is that he forever came to rest with you, to fulfill something in you that nothing else can. Now, I love my wife. When she looks at me, and I'm, I don't care who you are in this place, you could never, ever look at me the way she does. Okay, she looks at me sometimes like I'm a piece of meat, and I don't like it, but she looks at me sometimes, and I think to myself, woman, I am human. I think that's the other way around, but that's okay, right? Okay. In my brain, this is how it's happening. Like, you know, 
But let me say this. Can I just say this, guys? Can I say this? I emptied the dishwasher the other day. Now, a lot of you guys do this all the time. I emptied the dishwasher, and you would have thought I was a hunk of meat in the kitchen. I was like, girl, happy Easter, by the way. You're like, is this an Easter message? Yes, it is. Welcome to Freedom Church. And I have to think that when I walk into the, her presence, when she looks at me, I feel something. And every wedding I attend, I'm looking at the people getting married, and I don't see them. So if I'm marrying you, you're like, why is he looking at me? I don't see you. I see my wife. I am so reminded of the time that we walked down an aisle and made a commitment to one another. I'm reminded of that love. Now take that to your relationship with Christ. Whenever you walk into the room, if you really have spiritual eyes to see, I would challenge you to understand that when Jesus sees you, he sees you like no one else sees you. He doesn't see imperfection. He sees perfection. He doesn't see a flaw. He sees everything he designed to be released through you. And he does not see who you were five minutes ago. He doesn't see all of your mistakes. He doesn't want to get into your sin issue. He says, wait, you leave the sin issue there and come over here to me. I got up on a cross and I came down off a cross because I love you and I want to show you what that love really is. There's a generation that is chasing love. We have reduced physicality. We have reduced things because people are chasing something that they will never find unless they have the presence of God. The love of God will forever change your marriage. It will change you as a father. It will change you as a, as a mother. I know there are people in this room and you were not loved by your earthly parents. Maybe some of you, the father left or the mother left and, and things have happened. But when you encounter the love of Jesus, all of that stuff just starts getting restored. And the things that the enemy meant for evil, God turns around for good because he has sought to love us. Lesson number two. From the cross, we are forgiven. Luke 23, 33 through 34. And when they came to the place that was called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminal, the one on the right and the one on the left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. After he forgives them, they start dividing his clothes. Now, remember on Palm Sunday when I said that the very same people, a lot of the same people who were laying the palms down before the donkey as he entered on, on the triumphant entry, those very same people that were laying fronds down were now putting crowns in his head. People couldn't understand, and so Jesus is, Jesus is sitting, he's, he's hanging from the cross, and he's, he's reaching out. By the way, the encounter with the one, and he says, I'll see you in paradise. There's something great about forgiveness because forgiveness is a new beginning. How many of you have ever experienced like a second? You're like, what do you mean? How many of you have experienced leftover food? Is it as good as the first time you, you would have eaten it? Let me change that because some of you are like, well, if it's chili, yeah, chili's good leftover. <laughs> I'm with you, okay? I didn't get this way for nothing, all right? So I'm with you. I, I, got, I got leftover chili with you, okay? So let's just talk about a filet, a filet that comes right off the grill, lobster that comes right off the grill or lobster that's two days old. When we think about forgiveness, we think, well, God still sees all of that. God is not a God of seconds. God is a God of new beginnings. He does not know how to give you a second or a third or a fourth. He gives you one every time. It is, it is over. It is a new beginning. It is a new start. It is you all new. So some people walked in this room and you're like, well, you just don't know me. No, I don't know you, but I know me. And I know the Jeremiah who was walking in sin and the Jeremiah who encountered God and that Jeremiah was redeemed, that Jeremiah was set free, and that Jeremiah had a new beginning. And the same new beginning I had, he has for you. Why? Because forgiveness is what he releases. 
It's a lesson that he teaches us that we would actually extend that to people around us, that we would actually be a people who walk in forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted. How many of you have mastered that, being kind and tenderhearted? You're on the greeter's team. Both of you. (laughs) New beginnings, Lord, new beginnings. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you, as Jesus demonstrated forgiveness, so we ought to extend forgiveness. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Then Peter came up to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? How many of you had that conversation with Jesus? I've had that conversation more times than I would like to have that conversation. Lord, you don't know. You only had Judas. I got 20 Judases. Have you ever had that conversation where you're like, God? And this is what he says. He says, as many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. How many of you mastered that one? These are just simple lessons from the cross. They're so simple, but yet so hard for us to grab a hold of. Why? Because if we first don't have the first lesson of love, then we're nothing but a clangy symbol. So we say things like, I'm sorry, but we're really not walking in true repentance or walking in true forgiveness. But when we get love, then we can get a hold of forgiveness. And then we begin to walk differently because we're extending forgiveness. Acts 7, 60 says this, and falling to his knees, he cried aloud uh, with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Do not, this is Stephen. Stephen watched Jesus. And when, when he's going through his persecution, he does what he saw his leader do. Jesus didn't do something, Jesus didn't say something that he didn't do. He actually walked out how how much the Father loves us. That's what he walked out. And he walked it out daily and he walked it out often with the disciples. Lesson number three, are you with me? The third lesson from the cross is that we are free. Now, whether you want to admit it or not, There is an incredible load of anxiety, guilt, fear. All of these things are things that we carry in the world. All of these things are things that we regularly encounter. And most oftentimes, if you haven't been diagnosed by a family member, how many of you have WebMD family members? You know, you're sad like three days straight and you're like, I think you're clinically depressed. (laughs) You know? I got a bump. Let me, hang on, give me a second. They web me, but you got stage 19 cancer. And you're like, huh? Really? One time I got up and I, I, I was going to the bathroom and um, I, was, I started peeing blood. And I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure this isn't good. So I did what every good Christian should do. I Googled it. Okay. <laughs> Now, mind you, in the second row, there's a doctor who's a really good friend of mine who tells me to never Google anything. So I Google it. After I read three paragraphs, I put the phone down, start speaking in tongues. I lay hands on myself. I prophesy over myself. I declare healing. And then I text him. And I'm like, yo, uh, hello. I hope you're up. I hope I didn't wake you up early. But um, I think I'm dying. And he's like, um, you probably have a kidney stone. And I'm like, nope, I read that. I don't have that. Have you ever argued with a physician? Have you ever argued with the great physician? And so I'm having this conversation, and the whole time I'm having a conversation with him, I feel like Jesus is having a conversation with me in my bathroom. He's having a conversation with me. Like, boy, yesterday you were so full of faith. Well, last week when you were preaching that message on healing, 
boy, you laid hands on them like they were going to be healed. Interesting how we find ourselves getting put into positions. And I, I don't know if you've ever done this or been, you know, like you, you have like that family member. Everyone has that family member. You know who that one is? Don't look right now. Don't look. They're probably at church with you. It's Easter. They probably came with you today. You're, you know, one, somebody already looked at the other one. I saw them and they, they pointed. They didn't even look. They were like, this is the one. According to her, I can't even walk straight. I mean, this is so bad, right? And, and so sometimes we're, we're self-diagnosed or we're, we're having these. And, and I, I sometimes look at the Bible Um, like a prescription pad. Um, whenever I've needed something, uh, Rishi's kind of like our like little family doctor, and we call him. And the thing I love about him so much is that he prays for me first, and then I'm like, okay, now give me some medicine. <laughs> he prays for me, and and he has this little pad that I don't have, and he writes things on it that I don't understand. And sometimes I feel like whenever we get our Bible out, Jesus had written prescriptions for us. And sometimes we look down and we're like, I don't understand complete and total healing, but I don't feel that. And he's like, well, wait, just put the script in. Because at the cross, I wrote the greatest prescription for your life, the one that was going to forever change you. I first demonstrated love to you. Then I walked in forgiveness and wait, now I'm going to set you free so you don't have to be bound by anything. You're no longer bound by sin. You're no longer bound by who you used to be. You're no longer bound by an earthly bloodline. You're no longer bound by what they say you are. You're, you're no longer, you are now free. You're free. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8 says, he God is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. He actually went and purchased your freedom. This church is called Freedom Church, and on the wall it's Galatians 5.1, and it says that um, it's for Christ that has set us free. In essence, God said, wait, you can't love me the way you're called to love me and be bound the way you're bound. Once you experience the love of God, once you experience the freedom of God, now you can experience true freedom. And that freedom, a lot of us just aren't comfortable. How many of you have ever had a dog and you, you kennel trained your dog? Did anybody ever have kennel train a dog? Okay. For the rest of you, if you had a dog, you should have done this, okay? This is why your carpet doesn't look so good. You should have kennel trained them, okay? For like the first year, my wife's like, she's like the dog guy who pokes the dog. What's Caesar. She's like Caesar. She watched him like religiously and she became him. Right? Our dog would ground. She'd go, psst, 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 psst. He's an obedient dog now. Well, I mean, let's not, let's not get carried away. That would be a lie. <laughs> when she chooses to be obedient, she's an obedient dog. And, and I, I remember when we would open up the gate, she would come out and then I would walk in from outside, like I'd go to work. And she would be in the place of familiarity. She would go back to captivity because that's where she was sleeping. Even though she was free, she was still living in a place. Jesus ripped the door of bondage off your life. And he says, wait, this is not a place you go back to. You are truly free. And who the sun sets free is free indeed. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, for the Lord is the spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had the veil, the veil removed, can see the reflect of the glory of the Lord. The veil was torn at the cross. The veil was removed for our freedom. The veil was torn so that you had direct access to the Father. We don't need a middleman. He gives you direct access to him. John 8, 36. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. All right, you got to preach one more time. Look at your neighbor and say, you are truly free. You are truly free. Truly free. Last point. 
and we'll make it quick. The fourth lesson of the cross is the finished work. Actually, I only had three, and then I thought there's no way we can leave out the finished work. The last saying on the cross, um, it carried some, not just, I, I think sometimes, how many of you have read the seven last sayings of Jesus on the cross? And when you read them, sometimes, if you don't pause and really reflect, you can kind of miss the significance of each thing that he was doing at each stage of the process. This final one, um, I'll, I'll give you the Greek word for it, but it's tetelastai, and, and this word would be paid in full. I actually have a t-shirt that says this Greek word on it, and I was going to wear it today, and then I was like, no. I don't know why. I just didn't feel good in it. I didn't feel like it fit me with this suit the way it should fit me. But I was like, dude, I'm going to use this word. Sarah, I should wear this shirt, right? And then she was like, yes. And I was like, but it doesn't look good. So I took it off and changed. All right. Ted Elastai. Can you say that? Ted Elastai. For all you Spanish people who try to teach me Spanish, here you go. Ted Elastai. Okay. That's what I look like whenever you're trying to teach me how to say something in Spanish. They say a word and I go, huh? It is finished. The finished work of the cross. I, I don't know if you've ever, maybe someone in this room, you might have this testimony. And I'm closing with this. You might have had this testimony. Have you ever owed a $100,000 debt and somebody walked up to you and said, the debt's gone? Anybody ever had that experience? If you, could you raise your hand? Yes? How did that feel? Amazing. It was Jesus. All right, here we go. Ready? I've asked that question before in church and no one's ever raised their hand. That's the first one. So y'all should go have her lay hands on you to get like. <laughs> Think about this. Imagine you're going along in your life and you get an IRS bill. Oh, y'all some business owners in here. They're like, oh, shut up. Oh, so, oh, Lord. He's not prophesying that, is he? All right, you get, a, you get a bill. You get a bill from the IRS for $700,000. Now, I don't know if you've ever negotiated with the terrorist called the IRS. I don't know if you ever have or not. They don't oftentimes answer their phone. So a year ago... Sarah and I got a bill in the mail. I think it was like 40 some thousand dollars. 52,000. <laughs> 52,000. You know who pays our bills. Okay. 52,000 and she opened it and she had this look of terror. Now we the following weeks prior to this had experienced some major family trauma. So in January of last year we lost Sarah's mom. She went home to be with Jesus. And then at the end of the year, Sarah's dad transitioned to be with Jesus. And then we got an IRS bill. Good year, right? And so I'm looking at Sarah and I'm like, it's okay. We don't owe it. And she goes, you don't understand the IRS apparently. And I'm like, apparently no. <laughs> so we should have a prayer uh, vigil is what you're saying. We should like light some candles. We should come around it and we should lay hands on this thing and pray it goes away. She's like, no. She called and she called and when she was calling she would text me. I have been on hold for three and a half hours only to have them hang up on me, Jeremiah. This is your fault. I'm like, this is not even my bill. Finally she gets through and we get to a person who says to her, send me all of this information and I will take away the debt. Sarah says, ma'am, I need your name, badge number, a blood sample, and I need you to give me where you personally live. So Sarah's having the conversation. She gets her personal information. And then she's like, well, uh, I don't know when she hangs up if it's really gone. I will never forget this conversation. Because I'm like the preacher guy, right? I'm on the other end of the phone. Babe, it's going to be fine. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. 
He never leaves us begging for bread. She's like, boy, you ain't been on the phone. I have. And I'm like, well, I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to hang up and go back to work. So I'm praying, and, I, and we're praying, and then all of a sudden it comes in the mail. And the countenance on Sarah's face was as if she saw something she had been waiting for her entire life. She opened it up, and it was debt canceled. When you walk into the throne room of the Father, you open up an envelope. It's called the book of life, and your name is on it. And when you read your name, your debt is forgiven. Your debt, your past is gone. When you walk in, all of a sudden, the Father says, wait, I've been waiting for you to walk into this room with me. And when you walk in, it is debt gone. Now, I know maybe you haven't owed a lot of money and you haven't experienced that, but I know two people that have experienced that in this room. Now, you would think that I would be the one that was a little panicky. I didn't panic until I saw the look on Sarah's face when the debt was canceled. Because then I was like, that was way bigger than apparently I thought. <laughs> Sometimes... You're in this room, and you've been walking with Jesus a very long time. And you walk by people, and you forget that your debt was canceled. You forgot your sin was washed away. You forgot that you were made new. You forgot you were renewed. You forgot you were redeemed. And we walk around people, and we're never extending an invitation to the power of the cross. We wear them, and we reduce them to decorations on a wall, decorations on our neck. But I can tell you, the cross carried great significance. It wasn't just a piece of wood. It was the man that they put on the cross who had such love for you that he forgave you of the sin you have yet to even commit, that he loved you so very much that when he forgave you, he said, wait, I need one final thing. It is finished. And in essence, what he was saying is everything the Father has told me to do, I have done. It is finished. And when he said it was finished, guess who gets the assignment? The last and final time I'm ever going to ask you to preach today before you end up at the Ponderosa. Look at the neighbor somewhere around you that you've yet to preach to. Because you can't preach to the same person. They get a complex. <laughs> Let me demonstrate, okay? If I preach the whole message looking at Johnny, about 10 minutes into the message, Johnny's going to be like, I'm pretty sure he thinks I'm the sinner. You have to move around, okay? So you got to find someone you don't know. And you have to look at them and you, you have to, you might have to get up out of your seat. I want you to look at somebody and I want you to tell them this morning, it is finished. Come on, say it again with some conviction. It is finished. It is finished. Come on, look at somebody else and say, it is finished. It is finished. I love that the promises God gives us and the lessons we can learn through the cross are so powerful. So what are these lessons? The first lesson is love. The second lesson is, y'all preachers now, you gotta remember your own notes, okay? So the first lesson is, the next one is forgiveness. I don't know how to do how to say the sign language for forgiveness. Forgiveness, the next one is, it's on the wall. And the fourth one is, all right, now we're going to do it together like we really know what we're preaching about, okay? Because this is the thing. You should get up and leave here, and you should know. You should know these four lessons. You should know that you are loved by God. You should know that you are forgiven. You should know that you're set free. And you should know that it is finished. So here we go one more time. One. Two. Two. Three, four, it is finished. Stand to your feet, if you will. I'm going to pray and close. God, we thank you so much 
for your love for us. God, we thank you so very much for your forgiveness. We know we do not deserve it, but God, you loved us so much. You sent your son to die on a cross for us. God, it was not just enough that you loved us. It wasn't just enough that you forgave us, but you chose to make us free. You chose to rip the cage away from us, the sin, the bind of, the bondage of sin. You chose to remove that. And God, on the cross, you said, it is finished. The work is complete. And God, we know that we can rest in the truth that you are a loving God. Amen. That you're a good God. That you're a faithful God. So just before Sarah closes, if you're in this place this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe, maybe you've just walked away. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to shame you. I'm not going to make you do some walk. I'm not. I just want you right where you are to just, just put your hand over your heart. I just want you, if a matter of fact, can everybody just pray this prayer with me? Jesus, I ask you I ask. to come into my life. I give my life to you. Give my life to you. From this day forward. This day forward. I make you. I make you. My king. My king. Jesus. Jesus. Today. Today. Is my first day. Is my first day. With you. With you. Come on, if you if that's you, if you'll just let somebody know, let us pray with you. Our heart is that you wouldn't leave the same way you came in, that you would leave knowing the Father. We love you, Sarah. Amen.